Welcome to the video guys where today we are looking at fast 85 millimeter prime lenses. Now fast 85s are an extremely versatile and popular choice of lens for photographers for their very shallow depths of field, their ability to isolate subjects which makes them very popular for things like portraiture. So much so, in fact, I will wager if you go onto a photography forum and you ask people to name one must-have lens, at least one person is going to recommend some form of Fast 85 Prime. However, some of them can be quite expensive. So today, I'm going to take a look at four of what I believe are the best budget options for Fast 85mm Prime lenses for the Sony E-mount. And the options we have are obviously the Sony 85mm f1.8, a very popular choice for Sony shooters. In fact, this is my own personal lens, which I've owned for about two years now, which is why you will notice there are some paint chips and bits of writing have started to scuff. It's because it's a used lens, but it is only cosmetic. The lens still works exactly the same as if it were new. We also have the Viltrox 85mm f1.8, which was sent to me by Viltrox about 18 months ago to review. Um, but they've subsequently replaced this with a Mark II variant. However, optically, the Mark II is identical to the Mark I. The main changes are the build has been adjusted to bring down the weight and the autofocus performance has been tweaked as well. So I will factor that into my assessment of the lens later on. We also have the newly announced 85 f1.8 from Yongnuo, which is so new in fact that at the moment it's not actually available in America or the European market. It's only available to buy in Asia because of supply issues caused by the pandemic. Now this is only going to be a relevant piece of information if you're watching this video shortly after it's been released, i.e. late 2020. I imagine by early 2021 and beyond, this lens is going to be widely available across all markets. And lastly, we have the Samyang 85mm f1.4. Now, this was not sent to me by Samyang. This is actually one of my subscribers' lenses who was very generous and got in touch with me a while back and asked if I would like to borrow the lens in order to test and review. So once I finish this video, I will be returning it to them. But Christian... A massive thank you to you, sir, for really making this whole video possible. So the format for this review is going to cover these topics, and there are timestamps down below if you wish to jump ahead to a specific part of the video. If not, we'll kick things off with the build and the features for each of these lenses, starting with the Sony. The Sony has pretty decent build quality. It has a metal underlying chassis to give it rigidity, but then a plastic exterior to try and help keep the weight down. Now there's pros and cons to this. The pros are that it only weighs 411 grams, so it's not a, a heavy lens. It balances perfectly on an A7 series body and even balances pretty well on an A6000 series as well. The drawbacks to this are that it doesn't have the same sort of premium finish to it. However, don't think that this is somehow a very poor quality lens because it's not. It does come with weather sealing gaskets inside so you can use it in harsher conditions. And I can personally vouch for the build quality of this because I may or may not have had this lens fall out of my kit bag onto concrete in the past and it still works perfectly. It has a smooth turning plastic manual focus ring. There is an AF MF selector switch and a customizable program button there as well. It has a 67 millimeter front filter thread and a minimum focus distance of 80 centimeters, which means it's not really a macro -y type of lens. Spoiler alert, none of these are. Next up, we will cover the Viltrox. Now the Viltrox is a slightly larger lens than the Sony. It's fitted with a 72 millimeter front filter thread. It has a very large manual focus ring that uh, has a metal finish to it, but I do find the focus rings quite heavily damped. Now, this is personal preference depending on whether you like a, a lighter focus ring or a heavier focus ring. This one, personally, I found to be a bit too heavy for my own personal taste. The overall fit and finish of this lens, however, looks fantastic. It's such a slick, clean design. There's no buttons, there's no uh, switches on there at all. You've got the focus ring and that is it. 
The thing is also built like a damn tank. It is entirely metal construction inside and out. However, that did come back to bite Viltrox on the backside just a little bit because this Mark I version weighs 646 grams. So is 50% heavier than the Sony offering. Now, that was really, I think, the big reason why Viltrox opted to make a Mark II variant of this lens because the Mark II version, although still having metal construction inside and out, they've simplified the design to bring the weight down to a much more reasonable 484 grams. So while this lens feels rather front heavy, even on a camera like the a7, I imagine the Mark II is going to balance that little bit better. Now, despite the fact that this has got the build quality of a tank, unfortunately, it doesn't have any weather sealing, which is a little bit of a disappointment. Now, one aspect of third-party lenses that is sometimes a concern is firmware. Thankfully, Viltrox have addressed this by including a micro USB port on the lens mount, which allows you to connect this lens directly to your computer to drop new firmware onto the lens. Next, let's look at the Yongnuo. Now, this is by far the lightest lens of the lot at 354 grams, so a little bit lighter than the Sony. But you can kind of tell that because the fit and finish to this is clearly a lot cheaper. I get the sense that it still has a metal underlying chassis to give it some strength, but the outer fit and finish is very cheap plastic. So while the Viltrox looks very premium and the Sony looks slightly less premium, this looks really not premium at all. It just sounds in areas very hollow. However, that lightweight and smaller size does mean that it balances absolutely fantastically on an A6000 series camera. Again, it has a manual focus ring. This is a pretty smooth turning manual focus ring and does have the great added benefit that they've got a rubberized finish to it, which none of the others do. So the grip of this ring feels really great. However, it just sounds and feels cheap and tacky when it's turning. That doesn't affect how it actually works. It works absolutely fine. It's just the overall feel of the lens is clearly very budget. However, what isn't budget and what did surprise me is not only is there an AFMF selector switch included, there is also a customizable program button like you find on the genuine Sony lenses, which was a real surprise for me. Yongnuo have also addressed the updating firmware by including a USB Type-C port on the side of the lens and there is a little rubber gasket that comes with it to try and help keep dust and moisture out of there. However, on being under no illusions, that is about the only weather sealing on this lens. There is no internal gasket at all. And the lens hood is not the best either. It surrounds only a dinky 58 millimeter front filter, so filters for this lens are going to be dirt cheap. But the hood is a bit shit, if I'm being honest. If you just put it on and turn it 90 degrees, it doesn't actually lock into place and can easily come off. But to get it to lock into place, you really have to kind of wrench it onto the lens. Once it's on, it's secure as hell. That is clearly not going anywhere, but just getting it on feels like you're gonna break the lens hood. And then it's obviously difficult to undo the hood as well. So not the best designed hood, but then if you're someone like me who generally never takes the hood off a lens anyway, might not be a concern for you. And lastly, the Samyang. Now straight away, this lens is clearly the largest of the lot, but that's unsurprising given that it's an f1.4 rather than an f1.8, you're getting two thirds of a stop additional light. So it's kind of a given that it is going to be a bigger lens. And the fit and finish of this lens looks fantastic. It's such a premium looking lens, it's unbelievable. But don't let that fool you into thinking that this is going to weigh an absolute ton. It doesn't. Because similar to the Sony and the Yongnuo, this has a metal underlying construction, but an outer plastic shell. Now it's high grade plastic with that premium looking finish, but it does help reduce the weight. So weighs only 642 grams. So it's actually a, a hair lighter than the Mark I Viltrox lens. But they have at least included weather sealing gaskets, which is great to see. Like the Viltrox, it has a very minimalist design, no buttons or switches. It just has a very large manual focus ring, which turns very smoothly. And you can also update the firmware on this lens, like with all the other ones. However, this one is done via a USB dock that you connect the lens to that goes into your computer. So if you don't already have that dock, 
it's be worth bearing in mind that might be an additional cost for you to factor in. My only criticism of the design of this lens, the overall outer feel, is the lens hood. The hood is plastic and feels fine, and it surrounds a 77mm front filter, but it doesn't feel the most secure when it locks in place. There's a very subtle click, but it doesn't feel like it's really holding the hood in place. The hood is very easy to knock loose. Now, granted, in the time that I've been testing this lens, it's never actually come loose once, but it's always just feels like it could easily be knocked and fall off. So I really wish that this hood just had that a little bit more of a sturdier click to it. But that is my only real criticism of the design of that lens. So that's the build and features out of the way. Let's move on to image quality, starting first with image sharpness. Starting again with the Sony. Center of the frame is pretty sharp. The corners do drag behind quite a bit softer, but that's not unusual for fast prime lenses like this. When you stop the lens down to f2.8, we see an improvement in sharpness across the frame, but the corners are still fairly soft. By f4, the center of the frame is extremely sharp. The corners now get pretty sharp as well. And then at f5.6 and beyond, the frame is very sharp all the way across. The Viltrox, similar-ish performance. At f1.8, again, center of the frame, pretty sharp. Corners a little bit softer. By f2.8, we see an improvement in sharpness across the frame to very good sharpness in the center, and the corners are now quite sharp. And by f4, we are looking at very good sharpness from corner to corner. But overall, I do know from previous experience that the Viltrox image quality is fairly similar in terms of frame sharpness to the Sony. It's a fraction behind across the frame at wider apertures, but once you get down to f4, f5.6, both of them are perfectly sharp all the way across the frame. Now the Yongnuo at f1.8, the center of the frame looks absolutely razor sharp and even the corners look very sharp as well. I honestly was not expecting to see such a performance from that lens wide open to the point that I actually had to go back and double check and make sure that it was actually at f1.8 that I wasn't looking at the wrong file and I was looking like f5.6. At f1.8, fantastically sharp image quality pretty much all the way across the frame by f2.8 it's damn near perfect so very impressive performance by the Yongnuo now the Samyang wide open is a little bit softer than the Sony and the Viltrox both in the center of the frame and in the corners but honestly that's not that much of a surprise given that this is an f1.4 not an f1.8 once you get the lens down to about f2, more in line with the aperture of these two, the image quality does exceed these. It's very sharp in the center, pretty sharp in the corners, and by about f2.8, it's very sharp all the way across the frame. The only thing about the image quality of the Samyang, which you will notice in some of these comparisons, is that it does produce much warmer colors than the other three lenses. If you're shooting in situations where you've got an auto white balance, the camera automatically corrects this. However, for a lot of these tests, I was actually shooting with preset white balances. And generally I found these three lenses for the most part were always there or thereabouts the same in terms of color temperatures, whereas the Samyang was substantially warmer. Just something to bear in mind, but again, is only realistically gonna be a problem if you're shooting JPEGs and using preset white balances. But obviously there is more to image quality than just general sharpness. So in terms of chromatic aberrations, the Sony does suffer with quite a bit of longitudinal chromatic aberration. You can see purple and green color fringing forward and backwards of the point of focus. The Viltrox actually has slightly less chromatic aberrations. It's not quite as apparent at f1.8 as the Sony, whereas the Yongnuo has actually slightly more chromatic aberrations. However, with all of these, once you've gone to about f2.8, they all clear up pretty much perfectly. The Samyang actually has very impressive results, even at f1.4. Wide open, there is a very, very subtle hint of purple and green color fringing. And again, once you've stopped down a stop, it's completely gone. In terms of vignetting, all with in-camera corrections turned off, the Sony shows a pretty standard performance that you would expect to see. 
fairly strong vignetting at f1.8, f2.8 it does start to clear up and by about f4 it's pretty much negligible. The Viltrox does follow a similar path in terms of vignetting to the Sony but at f1.8 the vignetting is that little bit more apparent. Now the Yongnuo has a very unusual vignetting layout. Generally as you will have seen with the other two the, the, the vignetting is a gradual darkening across the frame so it starts off negligible in the center and then gets gradually darker up into the corners. The Yongnuo however has very little vignetting up until the second thirds of the frame and then it suddenly gets extremely dark just as you get right up to the corners. So although overall the frame has less vignetting, those corners suddenly become a lot more apparent. And then the Samyang at f1.4 has pretty strong vignetting, but again, once you've stopped down to about f2, more in line with these lenses, that vignetting is very well controlled, and by f2.8, it's pretty much negligible. Now, another aspect of image quality that's very important for lenses like this is the bokeh, the out-of-focus renderings. Now, the thing with bokeh is it's very personal preference. But I will say one observation is if you've got lights in your out-of-focus rendering, so, you know, the orbs that you're going for, the Samyang, the Sony, and the Yongnuo all produce quite strong cat size at their widest respective apertures. The Viltrox does have an element of cat size about them, but not as apparent as the other three. But the Samyang does have the advantage that those cat size are happening at a wider aperture and a shallower depth of field, so they're actually more out of focus. So they're not as apparent as you would see in the Sony or the Yongnuo. And in terms of distortion, all of these lenses do exhibit some degree of pincushion distortion. The Sony has quite strong pincushion distortion when you have in-camera corrections turned off. If you have them on, the camera does a pretty good job of correcting those for you, but obviously it potentially degrades your image quality. The Viltrox and actually the Yongnuo as well both exhibit stronger pincushion distortion than the Sony and in-camera corrections makes no difference for them because I don't have any profiles in the camera for these. Now the Samyang actually has very well controlled distortion. Even with in-camera corrections turned off, the distortion is very minimal and with camera corrections on, there's not a lot to clear up but the camera does correct this. So very, very impressive distortion control from Samyang there. Now, moving away from image quality, let's look at autofocus performance. Now, all of these lenses have autofocus, and all of them are damn near silent. Unless you are shooting video using the camera's internal microphones, you're not really going to hear any noise coming from any of these lenses. Now, while traditionally lenses like this aren't really your first go-to choice for shooting sports and action, you might find yourself in situations where you are shooting a subject that is potentially moving a little bit erratically. For example, I have used my 85mm on occasions to shoot football matches where I've not wanted to take a big telephoto lens. And obviously in some situations with such a narrow depth of field, if you're relatively close to your subject, having accurate autofocus can be very important as well. Now, all of these lenses are compatible with eye autofocus, both in humans and in animals, which is great to see. So to test how well they work in terms of speed and accuracy, I ran a series of different tests. One of me standing relatively close to the camera still as a kind of close-up headshot to test the accuracy of how well they could latch onto my eye. Secondly, I did me walking towards the camera at a slow pace to replicate how you might have someone coming towards you if you were doing a portrait shoot. Then I took it a step further and was jogging back and forth towards the camera and moving a little bit more erratically to see how well they could track. And then I brought out the big guns and had Rusty running around the garden like a nutcase to see just how well these handle really fast action sports.
Now, for some of you, it won't be a surprise to learn that the Sony was by far the best performer in terms of autofocus. That's because the 85 is fitted with Sony's linear AF drive, which is incredibly fast. However, side note, because I have seen quite a few people get caught out by this, Yes, there is a floating lens element that does move around when you shake the lens. That is perfectly normal. Most of Sony's lenses have a floating element, which does make them so much quicker to focus, but it does mean there's that bit moves around when you shake it. But yes, the Sony, obviously, when the subject is static, locks on pretty much perfectly on the eye, as long as it's got a clear view of it. With slow moving subjects, it's absolutely faultless. With faster moving subjects, it wasn't entirely perfect. It did obviously still miss frames as well. But when it did miss focus, even at fast shooting speeds, it was generally, you know, a frame or two and it was right back with you as well, even with the faster moving subjects. The Viltrox didn't fare up quite so well. For static subjects, is able to lock on absolutely fine. Again, as long as it's got a relatively clear view of the eye. If not, it might latch onto your eyebrow but that's the same with all of these lenses. For slow moving subjects, it had a pretty good consistency, but there was times where it, it seemed a little bit unsure of itself. And when it got to faster moving subjects, it really did start to struggle. But uh, like I said at the start, the Mark II variant of this lens, Viltrox do claim to have improved the autofocus. And from what I have seen of reviews comparing the Mark I to the Mark II, that is the case but how much of an improvement, I honestly don't know. But I imagine it would probably bring it more in line to what I saw from the Samyang, which is the Samyang, again, with slow moving subjects, it tracked pretty well. With faster moving subjects, it did struggle. Although to be honest, that wasn't a surprise because it's an F1.4. It's got a bit more glass, a bit more weight to try and shift back and forth. So did struggle with fast action shots. Again, even with walking towards the camera, there were some missed frames, but overall, pretty good performance there. Now, the Young Nuo was a rather a bit of a mixed bag surprise. The actual rack focusing speed of this lens, when you're looking through the viewfinder, it's able to jump between subjects incredibly quick when they're static. However, when it comes to moving subjects, it does seem to get confused quite easily. I did notice even with the walking shot, it occasionally would take a while to even realize that I've drifted out of focus and then would suddenly jump back into focus and then lose me again. And when it comes to faster moving subjects, it was a little bit hit and miss all over the place. Now, I imagine this is a firmware issue. The lens clearly has the speed to keep up with faster moving subjects. It's just that it seems to get confused very easily. Now, maybe because it's a brand new lens, the firmware hasn't been completely ironed out and Yong Nuo will be releasing some firmware updates to improve that. But at the moment, it's a little bit inconsistent. It's quick, but it's not the most reliable if your subject is moving. For static subjects, it works absolutely fine. So that's the performance out of the way. Let's get tackling the price points. So at least at the time of recording this video, the uh, Sony is currently retailing for £539 in the UK or $548 in the US. That's only a hair cheaper than the F1.4 Samyang, which is £549 in the UK or $569 in the US. The Viltrox, by comparison, is a fair bit cheaper at £320 UK or $399 US. Now, for the Young Nuo, as I stated earlier on, this lens is only currently available on the Asian market. However, I was able to confirm with Young Nuo that they are intending on retailing this lens in the US for around $270, although no mention on UK pricing yet. But if we go with the figure of $270, that means it's around $130 cheaper than the Viltrox, which is close to being two thirds of the price and half the price of the Sony and the Samyang. Now, in terms of which of these lenses is the best for you, obviously only you can actually answer that question. But if I was to give my personal summary and experience from each of these lenses in terms of performance and price and value, the Samyang is a brilliant option, especially if you're considering shooting a lot of portraits. 
You're paying basically an extra 20 quid over the Sony for two thirds of a stop more light. And that f1.4 aperture is going to give you a lot more out of focus rendering, a lot more separation from your subject to the background, which is going to be great for portrait shooting. And the overall rendering of the images looks very nice as well. And in terms of the other elements of image quality, the chromatic aberration and the distortion, which are the two hardest to try and fix in post, this has them controlled extremely well, even without in-camera corrections turned on. But obviously it doesn't have the autofocus performance for if you're going to be shooting a lot of fast action subjects. So if you're sticking more for static and slow moving subjects, portraits, this is probably going to be a fantastic option for you. However, it obviously does have a bit of a high price tag compared to some of the other lenses. So if your budget doesn't stretch to beyond the 500 quid mark, the Viltrox, the Mark II version, is going to be a very good option for you. Again, the autofocus isn't going to be brilliant for fast action, but for portraiture, this is a fantastic budget option. It's got a good balance, in my opinion, between image quality, build quality, and general value for money. But if you are going to be shooting subjects that are moving around that little bit faster, then it might be worth considering the Sony f1.8. Optically, this might not be as good in terms of the renderings that it is able to produce versus something like the Samyang, but the faster autofocus more than makes up for that in my opinion. If you're shooting fast action subjects, you can have the greatest rendering lens on the planet, but if your subject's not in focus, the image is essentially worthless. But if your budget doesn't stretch to any of these, then you obviously have the option of the Yongnuo, which honestly, I have been blown away by. I've reviewed several Yongnuo lenses in the past and they are generally pretty cheap and cheerful. And that is kind of what I was expecting here. My only criticisms of this lens, obviously the build quality isn't particularly great, but that's to be expected. The autofocus at the moment is its big Achilles heel. It seems to have the potential in there, but it just seems to be very inconsistent when a subject is moving at all. But overall, in terms of the image quality, this lens has startled me. That and the inclusion of customizable buttons and AFMF selector switches really do help add extra value for this. If you're only ever shooting photos of subjects who are still, it's hard to beat the value for money that the Yongnuo offers. But the moment you start getting subjects moving, this drastically falls off. So that's it for this video, guys. Those are my thoughts and opinions towards these, but obviously which, if any, is the best for you is ultimately your decision. But if you are interested in buying any of these lenses, there will be affiliate links in the description down below if you would consider checking them out to help support this channel. Which of these lenses impressed you the most? Leave your thoughts and comments in the box down below. While you're down there, if you haven't already and you enjoyed this video or you found it helpful, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button and then hopefully, I will see you in the next video.